forward to uh, hearing him talk about community involvement and successful telehealth program development. Thanks. And later I'll be talking about how to use PowerPoint more effectively. <laughs> All right. So my name is Steve North, and uh, I'm really happy to be here in Arkansas. Um, five or six years ago, I was just beginning to think about telemedicine and met Brian Burke at, at a meeting and was quickly taken into the uh, UAMS fold, drank the Kool-Aid, so to speak, and have sort of been allowed to join the family a little bit since then. And, and it has been extremely beneficial for me and, and the program that we developed. So um, I'm not from Arkansas. We live out, um, I live in the mountains of western North Carolina, halfway in between Asheville and Boone. Uh, the Appalachian Mountains in one of our counties is Mount Mitchell, the highest peak west, or east of the Mississippi. And the program that, that we've operated, uh, developed and operated, um, is the My Healthy Schools program. And while I'm going to talk about that a little bit today, that's not really the, the sort of focus of this. So I'm going to take just a second and show, uh-oh. <laughs> yes, proceed. Continue to the website. And now I will, of course, not use the Wi-Fi. Sorry, I thought about this. Maybe I won't show her. Nice. <laughs> yep, will do. <laughs> Try this again. All right. In our community, accessing health care. I'm sorry about this. So it is a major challenge for many people due to barriers of geography, windy mountain roads, and also a lack of health care providers. We feel we're very fortunate to have the telemedicine program in our school. The advantage of providing health care for kids at school, it's often difficult for family members to come down and pick them up and take them to a doctor's visit. If uh, mom or dad can't make it, she often ends up in the emergency department at 8 o'clock at night for something that could have easily been treated through a school-based health center. The quality of care was phenomenal. By the time we would have been waiting for the doctor, he had already had his medicine. Not only did it help me to not miss so much work and Liam missed so much school, but we were able to be on the road to health. So we've been operating the uh, My Healthy Schools program for two years. We're in our second year now. And we've had a, a great success at developing community support. And how many folks here work in schools or with schools as part of their their program. So for folks who don't know, school-based health centers are um, growing in numbers. They're about 2,400 nationally right now. And the use of telehealth in school-based health centers is, is rapidly increasing. They really lead to better care for kids. And kids who are healthier have better academic outcomes. And great research out of the University of Cincinnati has shown Fewer emergency room visits occur, fewer missed days of school. And out of Seattle, there's research that shows that at-risk students who use a school-based health center have a lower dropout rate. And, and that's what it's about in my mind, is how do we prevent kids from dropping out so that they can become contributing members to our society. Um, I can talk about this for another two hours in a different talk. but. Really, it took a long time for us to get to this point. Um, where we are, we've gone in the last 18 months from, oh yeah, I heard about that television in the schools thing, to becoming seen as part of the healthcare community. And more parents seeing us as a, a viable alternative um, to leaving work, dropping back up the mountain from the Baxter plant in Marion, and then trying to get into the office where I, I have my day job and put this um, and get their kids seen. One of the challenges that I'm seeing now as we sort of move forward is that 
people in, te in, in telemedicine, we're innovators, we like cutting edge stuff, edge stuff, and sometimes like, oh, there's a new toy. I can buy that toy, and I can write a grant here, and then we've got the toy, and now you need to use it because I bought the toy. And we don't always put together a, a coherent plan um, as to, well, what are we going to do and how are we going to build support for this over time? And I feel that understanding your community is essential. In public health, this is something that is done all the time before you start a new community-based asthma program, a walking trail development. However, when money becomes involved, and, and they're sexy new toys, sometimes we forget these sort of basics. So I practice in a rural community, and um, change is often seen, people on the outside edge see change as something that is scary um, for rural communities. They don't want to accept new technologies. And if I were at one of the other 13 talks I've been to this year, this is where I'd put up the Chinese symbol for change and talk about it meaning the same, it being both a combination of um, fear and opportunity, but I like the road sign a lot better because it's a, it's a marker. It's somewhere that we are moving through, um, and we need to stop and often think about, well, how is this change going to be anticipated? How, uh, how, how can we anticipate the change? How are we going to find out from, our, from the people that we're trying to serve if it's going to be accepted and if it's going to work. So what's the role of the community in, in designing a new telehealth program? Whether it be a rural school program like ours or our next big rollout, we hope is going to focus on the fact that our two-county area has a um, $25 million BTOP grant to do last mile broadband. And so right now at my house I have DSL. Uh, I have pretty slow DSL. Streaming movies get real choppy, um, and that's the best you can get. My cell phone doesn't work in my house, and now all of a sudden, the, the little lady who lives up at the end of Bad Creek, um, up in Beulah Dean community in Mitchell County, she is going to have 100 megabytes per second right outside her front door. How can we embrace this and use it as a way to improve health in our community? But more importantly, well, I can go to a trade show and see 10,000 things that I could buy and bring back. How are we going to choose things that are really going to make a difference in health outcomes in, in the place that we live? And then all of this new technology is there constantly coming out. There are 40,000 mHealth apps that you can download and use. Um, and as the fellow in the talk for me said, one of the folks from LearnTelehealth.org, when you put a new app on your phone, for the most part, you're going to use it twice. And then it just sits there on your screen. Um, so, you know, I have a weight loss app that I don't use, obviously. <laughs> um, but how do we pick our, our, our equipment and how do we pick our, our interve intervention based upon community need and things that are going to work as opposed to, well, they were the nicest salesperson and they bought me a steak dinner instead of Pizza Hut. <laughs> so one of the things that we did was we did a fairly, a very comprehensive needs assessment. And this is a tool that I'm really proud of. We developed a 20-page, no, I'm sorry, 20-question survey, not 20-page, because <laughs> that would have been a failure. Um, and we used that highly validated backpack method of distribution in the schools. Um, and amazingly, we got about a 30% response rate. So we sent the, the survey home with kids, pen and pe pencil survey. Uh, parents sent it back. We incentivized the teachers a little bit by having a drawing uh, for the people who had the highest return rate would get a, uh, a, a day off, and we'd pay for the sub. Um, and we did really well. And we also complemented this with a, a teacher survey to see how teachers would look at, at telemedicine. And when we looked at the needs assessment, it was getting a bunch of different information. We wanted to know who the people were who would consider using our services. What services do people support in the schools? Or what services do people feel they would benefit from in, in home health or in an outpatient setting? Just because there's a need, you're, 
just because you refer patients for cardiology referrals to Mission Health in Asheville, are patients more comfortable with that, going there to the big house to be seen, than if they came to my office in Bakersville? Um, where is this going to be provided? If you're designing it, you want to know, well, when are, what are the times that people need this to be there? And then also, how's it going to work? Is a family going to be comfortable running equipment? Can you, can you tie that in? The best question we asked was, will you use it? We asked, what's the likelihood that you will use this service if it's provided in your school? And we got back that 52% of folks said, well, we'll definitely use or probably will use this. And less than 10% said, definitely not or probably not. And then about a third were in the middle of, well, I'm, I'm not sure. And we followed that up with a qualitative question. And thankfully, we had a nice summer intern who could go through and tally all these things. But we said, for those of you who weren't sure, what, what's the issue? Why aren't you interested? And, or why are you unclear? And that was really illuminating for us because parents said, well, I don't really understand if I can come to school with my student. Or who's going to be the provider? Will it be someone I know and trust? And, well, will this replace my regular doctor? And a wide variety of questions that we anticipated some of them, but not all of them. And that really helped drive our community education pro um, program as we launched our network. And we still, you, you know, have we have developed a frequently asked questions segment out of these this um, this box of qualitative answers. We also did listening sessions. We did about ten to ten to twelve listening sessions in uh, in our two counties. We sat down and talked to the school nurses, and wow, um, they were scared. They thought we were trying to take away their jobs at first. And up until the start of this year, the school nurses thought one of them was very concerned that we were going to take her job away. Um, and now Karen is one of our biggest advocates and has been just a great supporter of the program. And, and she'll have her job next year as well. Um, <laughs> we talked with teachers. How's this going to disrupt the flow of your class? We talked with parents. We went to the local Sunday night teen hangout uh, run by a, a local church group and talk to the kids about what services they wanted in the schools and how could we get bring them in. We also talked to local health care providers. These are my peers. Uh, there are about 15 of us in our, our area um, who do primary care. And we went to the nicest restaurant in town and sat down and had dinner. And I had a provider who's actually in the group that I go see. Um, Liz took me to task. It was like, well, we don't need this. Our office is a half mile away from, from uh, South Toe Elementary. If they needed me to come, I could just drive right up there. I'll just drive right up there. And she went on for 20 minutes about how this was trying to take her patients. Well, when I saw one of her kids through telemedicine at a different school, he had strep he had, and uh, resulting high blood pressure. And I, I was able to order a urine, get a basic metabolic profile, look at his kidney functioning, and get him in to see her a day or two later. So she had all the data there, knowing that he was in kidney failure, so what's called post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. She's like, wow, this really saved me time and helped. But the listening session to, to sort of get this started was really important. When you do a listening session, it's really important that you try to use a standardized text. If you're going from four different parent groups, to try to steer the process. You don't want to make everything rote answers. Yes or no, do you believe that? But you also, um, you know, telemedicine is a godsend. But you do want to use the same open-ended questions in each setting so you can compare and contrast what you find out. Look at different segments of the population. Patients, the people who are going to be presenting this, whether it be a home health aides or cap workers, nurses in your ER, and talk to the providers about their perspectives. And one of the things, we didn't do this because of, of our phase in, but this is a time at a listening session that you could actually bring three different pieces of equipment out for a, a home health event uh, or a home health intervention and ask each group to take a look at that. You could have three different blood pressure machines 
that are, you know, G3 and 3G enabled and say, well, Mrs. Jones, why do you think this one's going to be better in your home? So that you are choosing products based upon what your community wants and needs. And I think that this is really an important thing that we don't do. We don't often take the time to do a full assessment of the need, especially in a, a community-based program that's different than having telehealth in the NICU or in the, in the um, nursery, because right there, no parent's going to turn it down. It's not really a, a time at which it's a, an optional thing or telestroke in your emergency department. But when you're trying to build utilization and in telemedicine and, and community-based programs, there's no growth curve out there that you can say, well, after 18 months, we should have 50%, you know, of our slots should be filled every Tuesday based upon this, this, and this. So how do you use your, your planning sessions and your listening um, and needs assessment sessions to really get a sense of what's going to work in your community? So then you come up with all this information. And we were fortunate. My brother has a Ph.D. in sociology. Uh, Mike likes to tell me that he has a real doctoral degree, and I just have a trade school degree. And uh, he's right. It's absolutely true. I'm a... Uh, not an orthopedic surgeon, so not quite a frustrated carpenter, but um, you've got all these different points of information now. and How do you bring it all together into something that you can use? Well, we were able to do what's called a bivariate analysis. Your statistician at the community college probably can do this for you, but um, the information, don't read in the little bu bubbles. That's not, it's a picture. Nothing really related to what we're doing here. But you can use this information and apply it to your grants and your applications. I feel that we were extremely successful in our grants because we'd done this work in advance. We um, took a $40,000 community grant from a local foundation, matched it about two to one with Appalachian Regional Commission, and so we were at $120,000, and then matched that in a, another two to one match, a little bit different math, with, um, with USDA Rural Utility Service. And that gave us about $400,000 for our initial equipment purchases. And we constantly referred back to the fact that we had gone out and the community said they were going to use this. And that also led us to our initial operating funds. And so we had about $250,000 over two years for operating the, the network um, from a, a statewide foundation. Your, your needs assessments also are going to be used for your evaluation. You should be thinking down the road constantly, how do we know that we're doing what the community wants and what's going to benefit the community? If you haven't taken the time to ask your community, you're not going to know. And then you can constantly be tweaking and redesigning your program. We initially thought that, well, the parents who are going to want this are the, the parents who have the little kids with the runny nose at 7 in the morning, and i got to go to work, and I can just have them seen at school. But really, the parents who said they were most um, likely to use it were those of middle school and high school students. And so instead of deploying our, our pilot phase network, our first three units, in the elementary schools, we focused on two middle schools and one elementary school and found that that was a much better way to, to begin because it reflected what the parents said that they wanted. The other key is having local advocates, and the word champion keeps coming up again and again. And, you know, you need an advisory board from the community for a, a community-based program. Um, you need local champions, people who are Karen Brown, the nurse who wasn't a fan initially but now loves it, or the, the family doctor who's, you know, not spearheading the process and is going to say, this isn't taking away patients from the from my practice. They know that this is still their medical home. And you need to get out in the, the community and talk about what you're doing and show your, um, show your product. So we've been at football games and kindergarten registration and uh, a street fair in Spruce Pine. Um, the other thing is to have that you know, one minute elevator talk. And in our community there are about three elevators in the two counties. So maybe what we really need is, is more of a a one-minute, you know, produce stand talk or gas, uh, gas pump talk. 
but that tell people what it is that you do quickly and efficiently. And bringing on um, the, as one of our, our, um, our project uh, coordinator, um, Shell McCall, whose grandfather ran the department store in Spruce Pine, uh, and her dad is a local dentist, as one of our, our program staff, has been crucial and, and has been a huge success. And also having um, our executive director who has is part of a family with four generations in the county is also important. My big concern is, does any of this matter? And this is a little bit of me getting up on my soapbox. But data out of Dartmouth uh, and their folks who do um, healthcare utilization research is that we're going to go from about 300 hospital systems nationally down to about 20 um, over the next 10 years. And I am concerned that telehealth, this great way to get my patient who has cystic fibrosis to see her, her provider at Chapel Hill easily without the four-hour drive, and also see and also have another patient see the cardiologist in Asheville and another patient see the neurologist in Johnson City, that that's not going to be possible because of the cost associated with deploying a unit. And so you're only going to be able to use equipment from the big city hospital for patients being seen back at that big city hospital or in that health system. And so is telehealth, especially in rural and underserved communities, going to be based upon more who's willing to invest in putting a unit out there as opposed to is that the best specialist or the best system to connect to. And that's just, you know, an, an early concern I have. How do we turn public um, financing and telemedicine financing away from being top down where it's, you know, telestroke and so Every, teles every big hospital in a state wants to have a telestroke network because it's easy and very effective to having community-based tele telemedicine originating sites where a patient can go and connect to Chapel Hill, Johns Hopkins, UCLA, wherever, and see their professionals. So how can we help? Um, we talked about the Center for Rural Health Innovation, and um, Amanda Martin, who's in the audience, and I are, are here to sort of talk about what we do. Um, yes, we would love to talk school-based telemedicine with you forever, and uh, if you do school-based telemedicine or are thinking about it, please go to our website and take our, our survey. We're trying to get a, a sense of the growth of school-based telemedicine in the na nationally, because there's not a real good measure of it. But we also would like to help you with this needs assessment process and putting a plan in place so that you don't end up with a $200,000 grant for equipment only and a really awesome new toy to put in 50 homes, but no way to know if it's going to be used, no way to know if people are going to find that it's cumbersome, and is it really going to make a difference in patient care. Just because I can measure somebody's oxygen level every second of every day and have it sent back to my office. Is that valuable information? Probably not. So um, please let us know if um, we can help you in any way and uh, help you with this, this need, developing a needs assessment and developing uh, some listening sessions. The one caveat is we're funded through the Mid-Atlantic Telehealth Resource Center. And so if you would like our, our help, we're happy to talk with you. We get some federal funding and reimbursement. You need to get Adam to say, Adam Rule, who runs um, South Central Telehealth Resource Center, that we can consult outside of our region and that that's appropriate. He just needs to send a letter saying that, you know what, they actually know what they're talking about, so can we share, their, can we share our resources? Anyway, um, thank you for listening to me and my babbling. Um, but any questions, thoughts? Yeah.
Yeah, so in this situation, um, the patient went by the hospital on their way home and had the blood drawn. Um, we, our school nurses are not comfortable drawing and, tr and transferring blood or carrying blood at this point. We're still one of the things we're working on. But what can happen, what happens is in school-based health centers, um, parents enroll students at the beginning of the year. So they filled out a health information packet, given us insurance information, provided us with their primary care physicians, um, contact information as well. And then any time during the year, we can see that patient. The parent can call and say, I'd like you to see Johnny. Uh, he's got a sniffle this morning. Or the teacher can say, well, you know, it's, it's Tuesday morning. We have spelling test fourth period. Sally's here with her Tuesday morning stomach ache that she always gets to avoid the test. Can you talk to her? Can you see her? And we do that and then send a copy of our electronic medical note directly to the, the primary care provider saying they know what has been done. Um, we prescribe electronically and can arrange follow-up appointments as well. Our local ER is now um, recommending our program. So when a kid comes in, we're, we're in HIPSA areas, so there aren't 10,000 um, open slots to be seen every day. And um, so a kid comes in at 8 p.m. For, for strep throat, well, we can actually see them. It, they're told, you know, you could have been seen at school today through My Healthy Schools and are given a contact information, a pamphlet, and an uh, enrollment packet. In one of the districts, uh, the superintendent has said that only the school nurse can, can be the telehealth presenter, and we have fewer school nurses than we have schools. In the other district, we, we're working to train additional presenters. So a lot of folks in rural communities are CNAs working in the cafeteria or are first responders and EMTs, so they have already a basic level of medical skill. And the important thing that you know, we need to remind people of is that it's the nurse practitioner or the physician making the clinical decision, not that individual at the, the originating or, or spoke site. Yeah. I have a, a quick question. Um, you know, I'm also thinking about um, some uh, school-based clinic yeah. uh, visits for a chronic condition, so chronic mm -hmm. care versus acute care. Mm -hmm. um, and wondering what your thoughts were on doing the asynchronous, I guess, or the recorded types of visits versus the acute visits where you're one-on-one -on -one with the patient in real time? Yeah. Um, we did not pursue asynchronous uh, telemedicine um, for two reasons. One, nobody would reimburse for it. And two, I think it's much harder to do risk screening and, and behavioral-based stuff which when you talk about adolescents, the, the top reasons that, that they um, die, are the top three are preventable. And so you can't, it's harder to do um, a comprehensive risk assessment and engage the student in an asynchronous method. Um, I know that Neil Herendine up at University of Rochester, he's a great friend, um, and they use a blend of um, synchronous and asynchronous uh, telehealth and they've been HRSA funded for years and have no reimbursement stream in the state of New York, but they also have the best data of anybody out there on, on school-based programs. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve.